cutworms in the first place. Just from my observations, it seems like different species are going to be in different places in the field. Um, pale westerns, where I've found them typically is up on knolls. Um, haven't really seen so many down towards sort of the draws and lower parts of the field. Um, redbacks I've found sort of scattered throughout fields. Um, and then others like the dingy uh, I've found Uh, other cutworms, like the dingy cutworm, uh, I found more so in draws, not really at all up on hilltops. Um, so even telling uh, me or um, agronomists or uh, Troy where in the field, so like low spots, high areas, can help not only in collecting those cutworms, but also identifying what species they are. Um, a few notes about some different crops that I've been collecting in. Uh, I found that uh, cutworms, I don't know for me, seem a little bit more difficult to find in pea crops. Um, I'll see wilted plants, I'll start digging around and the cutworm just isn't there anymore. And it seems to me that because that pea has a lot more moisture in it, uh, it's not wilting nearly as quickly as something like canola is. So canola plants, I love looking for cutworms in canola fields because that cutworm clips that plant and it's wilting within uh, an hour for sure of being clipped. So the cutworm is still right there, whereas the peas, I really have to go searching in the soil around. And even then, sometimes I don't find um, the little critter that I'm looking for. Um, kind of an interesting note, um, as I'm going through the fields, what I've observed, and I haven't done any kind of scientific assessment of this, um, but if I don't find the cutworm right by the plant, I start digging west first because it's just been my observation that they seem to be west of the plant if they're not right under the plant. <laughs> Maybe that's one of those goofy superstitious things, but um, that's where I've tended to find them if they're not right under the plant. Um, so what do I do with all these specimens? Uh, they each get their own little home, um, basically a little um, like ketchup container. Uh, I have some artificial diet that I feed them and the the uh, intention is that uh, in the lab I rear these out to adult or to parasitoid, um, whichever uh, ends up happening, uh, so that we can um, get uh, basically information on where these various species are found, what kinds of fields, where in the fields, uh, what kind of populations they're at. Uh, I take weekly or uh, depending on how much time I have, uh, every other week photographs of every one of the cutworm larvae so that we have good identifying um, photographs to put together um, at some point in time in an extension publication hopefully uh, because really I've been looking on the internet for good pictures of some of these things and yeah you'll get good pictures of the redback cutworm that's the cutworm I've been finding most commonly uh, or most abundantly so far this year uh, but a lot of the other species, there just are not good photographs of them. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. I also take weekly measurements of them, um, and I'm recording the developmental conditions in the lab so that we get an idea of how quickly these various cutworms can develop under certain uh, environmental uh, or temperature conditions. Um, yeah, all the specimens are preserved, uh, either pinned um, moths or preserved um, for DNA extraction after they die uh, so that every one of the specimens that gets sent in to me is used by somebody to uh, increase our knowledge on uh, this particular group of pests. Uh, and as Vincent was saying, and I'll just reinforce that, there are lots of different species of cutworms. So, so far this year I've found redbacks, bronze cutworms, um, dingies, bristly, pale western, um, army, and black-sided. Uh, or dark-sided. So um, really the full gambit of the different kinds that we would typically be expecting uh, I found out in the field this summer so far. What's the predominant kind you're finding? Is there redback, any? for sure. Redback. Yeah, and the heaviest infestations uh, have been redbacked. Um, there was a pretty good infestation in a sugar beet field uh, and um, farther north, uh, Calgary Way, uh, a good heavy infestation in a canola field, both of them mostly redback. Um, but that's another thing maybe um, to note. 
Usually they're not exclusively one species in any particular field. So that field with mostly redbacks and sugar beets, I also found um, some pale westerns in there. Uh, in that canola field with a lot of redbacks, I also found pale westerns and dingy cutworms in that field. Um, so there is a mixture, but usually uh, the population is predominated by one particular species. I, um, when I go out in the fields and, and we do find them, um, it's always hard to decide on how much or if you should be spraying or not and, and you know what your thresholds are. And I think it's important for everybody to know that they are nominal thresholds which means they are just our best educated guests at this time. Um, so this information that, that Jeremy, the research that Jeremy is doing and, and uh, the other researchers across the prairies um, will hopefully give us a little better numbers for that stuff. Um, right now I think our nominal threshold um, is, is basically if they're actively feeding and doing a lot of damage. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact uh, number right now. Um, it's so many per square meter, but they can move so fast and, and they'll move either right down the rows or, or just sort of stay on the hillside. But also another indicator I think is how long they are and if they're actively feeding kind of on what, what instar they're at. Once they've hit their fifth instar, they're likely an inch in length, I think. Um, uh, and it depends on which species because they're, like uh, Jeremy had mentioned, and uh, Vince, there are many species out there, but once they're over an inch in length, then they're going to start to pupate, and, um, and then, we'll, uh, then they won't be feeding anymore, so it will be likely revenge spraying at, at that point. So if you're out there and you are finding lots of cutworms and cutworm damage, and they're at that half inch in length, um, I think that that's a pretty good indicator that they're still going to be actively feeding for a little while. Um, I've also heard the comment um, for, from um, agronomists that are a little longer in the tooth than I am. Um, they'll say that if you see birds congregating or um, you know seagulls or ravens, to, to often go look there, and they'll uh, that you'll find you know some sort of feeding uh, of some worm, likely a cutworm in some situations. So you know different indicators like that. I think with the season that we had last winter, that we had such a great overwinter population of almost all insects. Um, lots of agronomists I've talked to have found, um, you know, insects feeding on all crops this year. So I think it's important to make sure we go out and we scout vigorously this year. Even if you're in a region that maybe typically doesn't get lots of insects, which I think in southern Alberta here we all do, and we all pencil in one at least insecticide treatment. But, uh, you know, there's no really substitution for good crop scouting, especially when it comes to some of these pests that we, we don't know everything about. So if we are finding cutworms out there in our fields, um, you know, uh, you guys can give Jeremy a call. I'll maybe see if Ken can uh, post that on his website or maybe send that letter out to his contacts um, for collecting cutworms. Um, anybody that does submit a field gets their name entered in for a draw for a tablet of their choosing at the end of the season. So a little bit of an incentive. And, um, and you know, it's, it's doing the right thing. And um, a lot of um, industry players in the seed in the seed industry and chemical industry and then agronomists and independents and everybody's kind of coming together to help this research out because it'll help a lot of growers I think down here in, in well all across the prairies.